episode of St. Jamestown TV. Uh, this is your host, Naya Maddie, and today we have a very interesting episode. We are talking today about people who weathered the storm. Today we have Lisa Qualtrock and her team. Hello, Lisa, how are you today? I'm well, thanks, Naya. Thanks so much for having us here. Thank you. I uh, would love to, to know your team. Could you please introduce I your would team? love to introduce our, my team yeah. to you all. Um, so here we have Lovelyn D'Souza. Hello, hi. Tanfir Kalka. Hi. And Priyal Boyka. Hello. Thank you very much and hello and thank you for coming today. Thank you for having us. Amazing. It's a privilege. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. So uh, this research was done in the fall of 2020. Correct. Uh, and uh, it's gonna um, show the changes or the impact of COVID on St. James Town, right? That's correct. Yeah. Could you please let us know how it started and what motivated you to start working on this and what kind of uh, influences that attracted you the most for this study? Sure, I'm happy to talk about that. Yeah. Um, well, the study was motivated by um, wanting to do some research, like use my research abilities to kind of do something useful for the St. Jamestown community based on the fact that it's a very important community to this whole city and the, to the country, um, you know, as a, a landing strip for, for newcomers and also um, you know, there are a lot of strengths and assets in the community and also there are certain kinds of injustices that the community faces. So before the pandemic, I was actually planning to do some research on um, housing justice issues and residents organizing. And I had the plan ready to go, but then um, the pandemic struck, so I had to put that um, plan on the shelf because we couldn't do in-person interviews. So I decided to kind of do uh, something else that would be useful to the community and would help me learn more about the community. And I co-produced a, a podcast called St. Jamestown Stories, which looks at how the residents of the community uh, coped with the pandemic. Through doing that, I got to learn um, a little bit more and know more about organizations like The Corner, um, St. Jamestown Community Corner. And I also learned that it was sort of possible to do interviews remotely. Um, and so then an opportunity came about in terms of my university, which is the University of Guelph, um, was offering a special fund to people to employed in the university to do research related to COVID. Um, so uh, I decided to take advantage of that opportunity, apply for the fund, and I received the fund. And then at the same time, I was talking with people at the corner to see if they liked the idea of what I wanted to do, which was look at the pandemic um, impact on the community, but also how people were responding and coping and how the service providers were helping them. Um, so that's largely the story of how it came about. Um, yeah. Amazing. And how did you meet your team? Yeah, it was a really, um, really fortunate process. So um, with the facilitation by the corners, they really did help a lot with this study. Um, I was able to do a kind of um, uh, a call out, uh, basically posted a, a, an ad for these positions of research assistants. Um, and um, it was a very selective process. Um, and I chose people who um, showed that they were, like had a, a history of volunteering in the community, so they had a lot of network uh, connections in the community, and they also had certain kinds of experiences and abilities and kind of caring, and you know they had certain capacities in that sense. So I was really lucky to be able to form this team of researchers, and um, they did a huge number of the interviews that the, the study is based on. Wow. Was everybody like uh, focused on a certain area, or it was like dealing like a kind of collaboration on all like the mass of information you get? Well, one of the main purposes for um, hiring the team was for them to be able to conduct the actual interviews with the residents and to actually connect me with the residents because as as residents of the community themselves, they would have those links that I would have since I live near but not in the community. Um, and they also, as it turned out, helped to shape the study in a lot of ways because we had meetings where we talked about, well, what kinds of people should we try to recruit? Who should we try to interview? What are the characteristics of those people? Um, they also helped enormously in shaping the research, like the interview questions. What would we ask people? So that kept uh, morphing as we went along. Um, so they had a hand in, in, in that. Um, and they, of course, did the interviews and then transcribed them so that I could help me get all my sense of them. Fantastic. And so I will ask each one of you uh, what is like the uh, impact or the story that you heard from the community and you you felt like this works the most for, for this research. Like for example, what kind of questions you, you ask the community members? 
Well, in terms of the interview questions, it might be like it's, it's asking a lot to remember as it was a year ago that we did the interviews. Um, but, well, we asked them what were the impacts um, of the lockdown measures in particular yeah. on their social and economic lives. Um, and so that was the sort of core of it, but we also asked them, well, what, what kinds of social connections have you maintained or, or lost um, during all of this? And are you volunteer, you know, we asked people whether they were volunteering or whether they were giving support to others or receiving support from others and those sorts of questions. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. How did they also cope, you know, what were their coping strategies and uh, what were the silver linings? Like some people had a lot of challenges. Uh, some people were being, uh, they were socially isolated. And uh, some people were going through uh, issues which they couldn't really talk about. There were different type of issues. And it was very interesting, uh, like the people whom I personally interviewed, it was very interesting to see how each one of them struggled, but they kind of also had something good to say about the pandemic and how it affect them, affected them in a positive way. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, there were silver linings also. There was a lot of stress, a lot of anxiety, a lot of depression, but there were also silver linings. And I think uh, that was very interesting for me to hear like uh, for example, a small example, like people lost their jobs and uh, you know most people living in Jamestown are uh, low income and they were just, they didn't know what to do, you know, so uh, they started catering initiatives, they started providing food for people, you know, so they were like simple things like this which uh, people took initiative and we live in a community where when you take a little initiative, you also get the support. People come forward and they do uh, encourage you, they do help you. Yeah. Yes. I will also add that we actually ask about like what kind of support they got from the community. There was social, social isolation, they were uh, struggling with the financial uh, issue because lots of jobs uh, were not children at, at home. So we actually asked them like what kind of support they got from the community, what other programs they are connected with, and how all those came together and helped them to cope with the COVID-19 situation. Yeah, mm -hmm. amazing. And how did you put all the results together? Like how did you uh, work on it to get, to get it done? Well, I took on that um, job. <laughs> I didn't have to impose that on my team members because they'd already done so much work throughout the fall. Um, but I took it from there and I, I, I began to analyze the results in the spring. I, during the winter I was teaching, so I, it, I couldn't really get to the analysis. So, you know, um, basically it's a matter of taking the transcriptions and um, doing a certain kind of coding of the answers of the responses and deciding what were the themes. and. Uh, you know, finding that, for example, as, as Loveland mentioned, um, it was amazing how, how common it was for people to have employment, negative employment impacts. Like, we didn't choose people based on how they lost their jobs, but um, of the 18 people we interviewed, we take three out as they were retirees, but of the rest, four people lost their jobs in the pandemic, and six people had their hours uh, cut quite a bit, and they had to scramble to make ends meet. You know, um, and so that was something really jumped out. Um, they also, many of them were struggling psychologically, as, as Lovell mentioned. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and these were not the most isolated people because we wouldn't have been able to recruit them into the study if they were. Um, um, so it, it, the agency's actions as well, the service providers were also really striking in terms of they were able to keep providing services in different ways, but without, without stopping. Mm -hmm. Because they already had a lot of experience of dealing with crises. And collaborating with the collaborating with the neighborhood to, to do such things. Okay. In the times of crisis, you find a collective um, collective a kind of agreement, or you see symptoms of, of a lot of people emotionally, and it affects you know like the the new like so, sociological um, component component or. Uh, Form, form of, of, of 
of a, a certain society or, or neighborhood. How do you find, uh, let, let's say, St. James Town and all of us after COVID, like what, what ha has changed? And how cha it has changed yeah. us as a collective? I think my team members are better able to answer that since they live in the community. Um, I mean, it, it does seem to me that people's networks were kind of like dented by the isolation, the isolating effects, but they still have networks they drew on um, to get support and, and to give support to others. So we, in a study, we call this social capital. It's just like connectedness or networks that people have that serve as resources for meeting needs. And so there was already so much social capital there that um, Although people were suffering, they did manage to, to use the, those networks as uh, resources. But my team members will be able to say more about how do they find the community doing now? Like, uh, you know, I, I'm more, uh, you know. I, yeah, you go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, uh, they, they were connected with the organization, different organization in the community, too. And um, there are, like, lots of people are living there for many, many years. So they kind of had that connection, plus I believe that from our interview it came out that the social organization in St. Jamestown community, they, they did a tremendously good job mm -hmm. uh, connecting people, community kitchen and other, uh, other activities actually helped them. Probably not all, all of them, but it, it did help. Uh, in in certain way, so also um, it helped also from the social isolation. So um, lots of people were feeling very isolated because they cannot see their family members or uh, go anywhere. So kind of they choose to uh, volunteer for the organization, especially community corner. So. Uh, in their like whatever they can do in their capacity they actually try to contribute it also help, it helped them and it also helped the community too so they were doing it for uh, for with the hope that they can contribute to the community also that will give them something to do because they are very feeling very isolated so very lonely so it kind of help helping each other yeah. I think neighbors helping neighbors was uh, one thing what I personally observed during the pandemic and like Tanvi rightly said, the community organizations played a great role we, and uh, if, if you see St. James Town, you have the community organizations, you have the churches and you have uh, all these little little things which support the community. So people were called in the front to volunteer, you know, like uh, People were nervous because they were scared in the beginning of the pandemic to go and help because of the issue, so much issues, you know, going around the virus. So it was like, you know, the church coordinated with people, community corner, you have other organizations in Jamestown. So people were called forward to, you know, make uh, phone calls to uh, seniors, also people who needed it food baskets were there. So, you know, putting the mask and doing all of this, these things were very challenging. And to help people in the pandemic initially was very, it was not an easy task. Also, in the kind of buildings we live in, you have 32 and 33 floors, and you have like just four elevators, which also was, you know, had created a lot of issues. But to answer your question, Neighbors helping neighbors, people checking on people, friends checking on friends, community organizations connecting to the people whom they know, word of mouth, uh, telephone calls. They were trying their best to, uh, you know, get in touch with everybody, basically. So that was something which was amazing during the during the pandemic, and I think. Uh, after so many months today, people have also realized the fact that when a crisis like this happens, when you have a global pandemic happening, uh, it is very important to stay connected. This is the main, uh, you know, learning what people have also learned during the pandemic that one is to stay connected to people generally as friends and one is to also stay connected to, com to community organizations because in situations like 
like this they are the ones who come forward to help like sometimes it was really disappointing that the community is there to help but the people are not aware of that you know and when we were doing this 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 study we we realized that the residents had so much to talk about and to say that they were not some of them were not even aware that there are these there is this help available during the pandemic so it did help to uh, you know make those calls word of mouth and then eventually over a period of time people started realizing oh uh, there is this facility oh there is this facility you know so these kind of things really helped and then notices down on the you know uh, in the lobby because people were scared to use the elevators so the community organizations and people did a lot to uh, make people aware that there is a situation but we are here to to help like yeah mm -hmm. yeah i just really want to add uh, what my colleagues said is we could like uh, by doing this research i could see that uh, we could see best of humanity during the covid yeah. because many people they came forward to volunteer you know just to drop the meal uh, so they just came forward to volunteer and help people so we could see best of humanity did, did this surprise you like yes. i was surprised at how strong and powerful people came out and finding even solutions and solutions for business like yes. some businesses were booming during yeah. the, the pandemic and True. Uh, are there other surprises you found in the in the study like there are always expected results right. and right. surprising results yeah what, what did you find we would all answer maybe um, i'll say a couple of things that surprised me it's not like i mean it's a, one thing that surprised me or just struck me is how much people um the residents of st jamestown love they live there because they love it there you know, um, it's not just because they have to. Um, so th there's a slogan that goes around that it's a neighborhood of choice. And it really did come up because, you know, the, every person was asked something about like what they like or not like as much about living there. And they were all very attached to the community. Some people had to move during the pandemic, but moved and stayed within the community. And they like all kinds of things. They like the different kinds of diversity. Um, they like the neighborliness and that kind of thing. That was striking. Um, some of the youth impacts were striking. We only had a couple of youths in the study, but um, they gave a window on some of the kinds of stressors that youth are facing. And they're parents of small kids too, so parents of, parents of special needs kids were really saying, you know, when you don't have any in-person programs, you're, it's very, very difficult for the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Even uh, going for the counseling, doctors, it was very hard for the parents with uh, special needs children because both parents were not allowed. Some have uh, two kids, and like it, it was hard. And uh, whoever doesn't drive is is mm -hmm. even harder because taxi or Uber they only allow. Uh, like certain amount of people in the cars, so all together it was very hard for the community. Mm. Uh, you could also hear, you know, people were getting so crazy. Like uh, one of my, uh, one of the people I know in my building was like, you know, hey, Lavin, how are you doing? I'm so crazy these days. I talk to my plants and my micro, you know, my uh, yeah. microwave because people were living alone, right? And that that fear of uh, not going out, not meeting and talking to people, it really got to people who are living alone, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. yeah, so missed, it, was, really yeah, it was, yeah, it was totally crazy. So they were like, yes, I don't know what to do. Like, you know, I these days I'm going crazy. I'm talking to my furniture and I'm talking to, you know? So like, it was like in one way, people were also trying to uh, use humor I am a child care practitioner. I was uh, I started doing online classes with uh, children, and uh, I had to look at you know creative ways of uh, keeping them engaged because uh, these units are like uh, one bedroom and a little living area, you know, in a kitchen. So you have one person uh, working online. You have the child uh, also doing the online classes. You can actually you are actually aware of all the chaos which is going on. And then you have to make, you have to try to uh, make a little sense of it and, uh, you know, make the child sit down there. So these were like a little, these were challenges like over a period of time, which initially was a real struggle people went through. We all went through little challenges, but 
over a period of time, people started working their way through it. You know, they started reaching out and they started coming up with their own coping strategies. You know, exactly. they started making life comfortable within those four walls of the house. Like there was, fam there were families where you have four and five and six people living in one unit together. But there was a sort of an understanding. Also, sometimes you know you could hear neighbors at two and three o'clock in the wee hours of the morning also screaming and shouting. You know, there was so much of frustration built inside people. But neighbors were understanding. Like. If you are living in condos or you are living in you know other places and you are just yelling and shouting, the neighbor will just call 911 and say, hey, they are disturbing too much noise, you know. So, but it, it's, it's, people were understanding of each other, like, you know, they knew if the, if there is an issue going on in the neighbor's house or something, after two days, if you see that person or you text that person, hey, are you okay, is everything okay, like, it's not like what happened, what is the issue, it's like are you okay, do you need help, you know. And then if you know that that person is going through an issue and they need help, then you know like if I get that call I'll say okay, you know, this is the community organization, these are resourceful numbers, you can give them a call because a lot of they these people... are resourceful and yeah, helpful for each other. A lot of these people don't mm -hmm. know that there, there was, public health was giving in so much of information, you know, but people didn't know the route, the direction of how to go. And I think that neighbors helping neighbors through just through text and call and these kind of things help, even post-its, you know. Some people are not comfortable uh, sharing numbers. So sometimes we see people in the elevators, but we know where they live, but we don't really talk. So like little post-its on the door, you know, hey, are you okay? If you need something, this is my number or this is my apartment number. So these little, little things, you know, people did out of their way, putting slips on the door and, you know, these, these little, little things to uh, make people feel comfortable, you know, yeah. So, yeah. so when, when, like, it, it happens only in huge situations like wars or revolutions or crises that, like, many people would gather or share the same emotional or psychological feelings. How would this affect us as a society? Mm. Like what are the sociological uh, mm. effects uh, or uh, uh, like uh, consequences of that? That's such a good question, Mia. Um, I mean, there there are studies about what happens to people. Like, how do people recuperate from crises, disasters, emergencies of different kinds? Um, there's a sociology of disasters, and communities that cope better and they recover better are the ones that had stronger social network ties to begin with. It strikes me that this is a community that did and does have pretty strong social network ties, despite the ways we can see that those networks were being frayed um, by the pandemic. So for the rest of the city, I I don't know or how we'll all come together. You know, there's such a there's so much inequality in our society. Um, there's so much marginalization and injustice. Um, but I think that it's it would be good for this, the city to recognize how much strength and resilience there is in, it, in, this, in this community. Sometimes I think that's overlooked or it's not fully understood. I was going actually to ask you, yeah, like, what are the key uh, differences that made this community different in handling this crisis from other neighborhoods or communities? And I wish I could answer that, and my, my friends might be better able to answer that, because, um, you know, I haven't really looked into how other communities dealing. Some of the agency personnel, uh, service provider personnel that we talk to, they do have that kind of overview look because they work in different parts of the downtown east. Um, and I think that some felt that there are particularly strong ties in St. Jamestown. That, that's only really a very suggestive answer. I, I don't, I haven't comparatively looked at it, so I'm not really sure. My, my, my teammates might, might have some sense of that. Uh, yeah, we didn't ask that question mm -hmm. for sure. Um, and this is a very diverse community, so this this is really surprising. Like it's not that one community, everybody knows each other, same culture. It's not like that. It's very different lang languages, and lots of cultures came together in St. James Town. So I think it's over 140 languages in that such a small space, yeah. physical space. Wow. <laughs> so I think that this is very surprising, but. Um, 
I don't know actually, but I interviewed a few people who actually lived there for many years, over 20 years, one person over 30 years, so um, who lived there for a long time, I think they built a very good network mm. and they actually gave very um, uh, positive insights about the community and I think their experience also helped to connect the community. But we didn't ask that question. We don't. We cannot say that for sure. So, how understanding this would would help the neighborhood? And like, hopefully, post pandemic, we are still not over. But hopefully, we are going through this route. Uh, how would this study uh, uh, help St. James Town to understand itself better and to go forward? I'll take a shot at answering that, and I think my team members have also very, very good insights on, on this. Um, part of the point of doing the study is it's very um, an overview kind of study, so exploratory. So I wanted to use it to kind of think about what would be further directions for research, like what other things. It's meant to kind of signal what else we should be looking at, researchers like me or others. Um, so I think it did sort of, like in my view, did signal a few issues, like having to do with, for example, um, people's position as tenants um, who have fluctuating income and what's going on with the fact that there's no more moratorium on evictions, so is that going to be a, a problem in the future? It might be. Um, and also issues about work, so how much more precarious are people's work lives going to be? I think it's something that should, should be looked at. And I think it could be beneficial that the more the study is known, the more um, people can understand that this is a community of enormous strengths, not just um, struggles, but strengths. Mm -hmm. um, and then the agent, the service providers also are like a really tight web of collaborative groups that have a holistic approach to, to health. And I think sometimes their expertise is either taken for granted, so that means the government doesn't think it has to put more funding into these things, but I think this is not a time to be cutting um, social spending and programs for communities like St. Jamestown, but rather on the contrary to reinforce them and to look to the service providers and others who understand what's going on. Right. I think a study like this also, uh, you know, it's uh, it shows the voice of the people, the voice of the community, and uh, the most important thing is when the study like this goes on different, you know, it goes on different forums, different platforms, and it is heard. There is a there is a hope for St. James Town. People also live in a certain expectation and a hope that you know, is talking to them. They, they, there is a hope that you know people on the policy makers, people in authority, you know, uh, there will be some change for the quality of life of the people in St. James Town. So, a study like this, which is so meticulously prepared and planned, also. It speaks, it's, it's the voice, so when that voice is heard, you know, it is spread, it gets exposure and the right people listen to it. There is hope that there will be something good for the residents, you know, like they have so, they have an expectation, so if something is done from the, uh, the city, uh, from the city point of view or the provincial point of view, so like, the people who are in authority, opinion makers, you know, all these people, I mean, if they come together and they address these issues, which nobody will know if something like this is not done. It's only when you do these interviews, you come on the grassroots level, you talk to people, you, you, you actually listen to their issues and you bring it out in a study like this. And when a study like this, goes out on forums and it is being visible and heard, that is when something can be done, you know. I mean, it's not that, okay, the study is done, but we are hoping to get something good for St. James Town out of the study, like, you know, all the issues which have been addressed, if they are actually heard and seen, yeah. yeah. So. so, for sure, the findings can, uh, is, is helpful to uh, push the policymaker, like what this community need, and of, of course how to address these mm -hmm. issues. Mm -hmm. Through this study, like we came to know that uh, pandemic uh, has a hardest blow on the people with the low socioeconomic group. Uh, yeah. 
because you know uh, many people they are living in one house inability to work from home less green space mm. uh, then uh, food security is a major issue then uh, people with mental illness you know they were also suffering so maybe you know we can work on all these issue and we can be prepared for further crisis like this mm, yeah how did you come up with the name okay. um I don't know. I'm not that good at coming up with things for things. Yeah, the, the, the title of the project that got the, for which I asked for funding was much longer and more long-winded, and you fall asleep by the time you're done saying it. Um, but whether you storm, I don't know. I, I was thinking about um, a song by Steve Earle, which talks about New Orleans being impacted by um, Hurricane Katrina, and they kind of had to deal with a storm. So I was thinking it's not exactly the same at all, but. They, you know, it's like a bit of a mm -hmm. pandemic being a bit of a hurricane. Oh. Yeah, probably should uh, develop it into a novel, you know, like imagine someone you know, like with the storm and the leaves behind. <laughs> <laughs> I got that feeling with the bright colors and stuff. I like that idea. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, would you like to say anything else or to tell our audience anything uh, regarding the study? Or your work time or the actually there is one thing I didn't ask about the atmosphere you had together while working especially that it was during the pandemic yeah uh, well we never met in person all four of us until today oh wow uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I met individually um, with each of the three but I don't know if the three of them ever met up before, we did. but as a group of four yeah. we never never met up before um, so I think that um, I felt like it worked surprisingly well, or just very well, maybe not surprisingly, but considering the constraints that the technology imposed, like the technology mediated communication is sort of hard, but but we had really good meetings that were very, like, lots of good ideas came from those meetings. I don't think we felt constrained. I, I didn't think that, mm -hmm. so. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. I think it was amazing to adapt to the new technology because, uh, you know, I was for the first time working with uh, with Lisa, we worked, we worked on MS Teams. There was so much of new learning, you know, which also happened on this study. And there was exchange of thoughts, exchange of ideas. It was wonderful to work and collaborate with the team and to know that we can do this just sitting at home. You know, such a big study. I mean, such a such an awesome study to do it just in the, just sitting at home. I mean, it was amazing. But yeah, it was a great learning experience with uh, Lisa and we collaborated as a team. So we had to make timing. We had to be. We had to do groups, focus groups. We did. So we did. We did a lot. We we learned a lot on this uh, study also. Yeah. And also for me, my um, uh, previous skills were enhanced. You know, with the computer and a lot of other uh, technicalities also. And also I learned new stuff, which is going to be beneficial for the future also. Yeah. Wow. So it was a wonderful experience doing the study. So yeah, it was a privilege, in fact, to uh, be selected to be doing and working with uh, Lisa and the team. That's wonderful. And I learned a lot from you too, and I enjoyed the privilege talking to you and sharing more about this amazing study. I would love to, to read it uh, when it, it, it's published already. Yes, um, it's sort of a self-published report, so I can happily provide um, the link to it for for you to include with the, wherever yeah, you post the interview. I'd be yeah. delighted to do that. That that would be fantastic. Yeah, thank you so much, and thank you for coming in. Thank, thank you. 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 And thank you, our audience, for uh, sticking around uh, today and listening to our beautiful and watching also <laughs> our beautiful study. This was uh, Nea Mani and uh, that was our episode today from St. James Town TV. So stay tuned for the next episodes. Take care. Don't forget to like, comment, share, and subscribe to our YouTube channel and check out all of our social media platforms. For more information, check out our website. Thank you.